We're making more progress here. And we're live. We are great. Thank you. You're welcome. So good evening, everyone. My name is Jenna Walker, and I am college professor and director of interior architecture and co-chair of the LTU co-ed lecture series. The College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University offers degrees in architecture, interior design, graphic design, game design, transportation design, industrial design, and urban design. We are dedicated to a pedagogy of theory and practice, the original motto of Lawrence Technological University, advocating not for one or the other, but for both, integrated and coherent. We embrace a three-part statement of purpose. We are focused on design, immersed in technology, and grounded in practice. Our lecture series looks to build upon these foundations, seeking out creative leaders who are carving new paths in the design disciplines, expanding current practice in architecture and design so that they may be more innovative, inclusive, and sustainable practices. Tonight, we have the great fortune of having a hosting Kia Weatherspoon. Kia is the vo design voice of impact and change. She has spent the last 15 years defying every design stereotype. The most, the most damaging of these is that interior design is a luxury reserved for a few. Her voice, advocacy for design equity and design practice have shifted the narrative, making interior design a standard for all. Kia is challenging the lack of these standards in economically challenged communities and her presence and leadership have created ripples, prompting housing developers, agencies, and industry partners in economically challenged communities to not only take notice of her work, but to do better. As an advocate and educator in business leadership, equity, and diversity, Kia has been recognized as the hip designer for good by Interior Design Magazine, a part of Washington Business Journal's 40 Under 40 class, and Interior, uh, International Interior Design Association's uh, recipient of the Luna Textile Anna Hernandez Visionary Award. Kia is adamant that change is possible when difficult conversations happen. She has them every day as a female leader of color, speaker, educator, and mentor who exemplifies what's possible for those who are determined by design. Kia, we are so grateful to have you here tonight, and we cannot wait to hear what you have to share. I am so so, so, so excited. We, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to have some fun. Um, I'm a lean inner, right? Uh, this will be a very engaged dialogue. And the good thing is I can see all of your names. So I, I will be calling on you. So you have to be listening. Um, and this is really about how do we create a conversation around design equity and design without labels. Um, I'm gonna pull up a presentation here shortly. I just wanna briefly tell you about my design story. Um, and, and that's gonna kind of set the tone here, I, I feel like. At some point, my dog Jasmine is going to bark, just ignore it. I'm going to give her a stern look, um, and we're just going to keep rolling. Um, so uh, Jenna, thank you for that introduction. Super glad to be here. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I came to interior design in a, a non-traditional traditional manner. Um, and this is the thing. I think sometimes life guides you to where you're supposed to be. And when I was in high school, my brother was incarcerated. He was incarcerated for 15 years. Um, and that started this journey for my family of going to these prison facilities off and on. Um, and I think it was around year two that I started to realize, God, this is a shitty experience for me as a visitor. The next year I started looking around and I was like, man, there are a lot of black and brown men in this facility. And these kids are coming to see their fathers. These spouses are coming to see their fathers, their brothers, their uncles. Their and I was just like, ah, oh, this is so indignified for the children. And I started thinking about these men. Then I started thinking about the staff who is literally serving a life sentence at 12 hours a day. And that just stuck with me, right? That stuck with me. Um, as I went through this journey with my family. Fast forward, I go to college and one semester I don't get financial aid. And I say, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna join the military and get money for school. And um, 
I joined the Air Force in 2001. I got to my first duty station um, in August. And then shortly after that, September 11th happened. And I was on the first of five deployments to the Middle East. And it was my first deployment. It was my first time out of the country. I was in a tent with about 14 other women on the bare base and I wanted to cry. And I didn't have any privacy. So I took some sheets, I hung it from the top of the tent and I made three sheet walls. And that was the first space I ever created. And I bawled like a baby for 15 minutes. And it was something about how that space brought me respite and comfort. It wasn't sparkly finishes and shiny things. It was just the power of space. And when I got in the military, I said to myself, I wanna do this thing where I create spaces for people. And most people are like, oh my God, that's such a cool story. But if you strip it down, I literally just articulated in order for me to realize my space mattered, I had to go to prison and war, right? So when we start this dialogue around design equity and, and communities that don't have access to elevated spaces that bring them solace and help just beauty, right? We really need to start to unpack why that is. Um, and that's where this idea of design equity comes in and how the labels, the socioeconomic labels that plague us dictate design outcomes. So one of the first things I did when I started my business, and this is going to sound a little crazy, Determined by Design, eight years ago was a nonprofit project for domestic violence survivors. You don't start a business and do free work, but the, the, the joyfulness of naivete, right? So I did this project for domestic violence survivors, and I approached these women very exuberant, saying, we're going to provide interior design services for you. And they were like, uh, one, we don't need this. Two, calm down. And then three... I was thinking to myself, do they not realize how their environment can change their lives? So it started this kind of mission with these 12 women and 32 children to say, all right, look, we're going to provide this service for you. We're going to create a design concept and a story. And it went from we don't need this to, oh, my God, someone would do this for us. I thought I could only see this on TV. And when the project finished, the woman said to me, not that it was pretty, which it was, she said, Miss Kia, when I walked into this room, I realized change was possible for me. And right then I knew the people who need access to well-designed spaces the most, they don't know they don't have it, they don't know they need it, and they don't have an advocate. And I've built my entire practice around being that advocate. And one of the things that I immediately started to discover was these socioeconomic identifiers that we use to house people, such as affordable housing, low-income housing, um, workforce housing, transitional housing. These identifiers are, are, are making, A&D professionals are making design decisions based solely off of economic factors. And how do I know this? Because I started hearing developers say things like, you're making it too nice for this demographic. And statements like, oh, these people will tear it up, right? So if our development partners are making these blatant biases towards how we can design for a certain demographic, how, is, how can we as designers shift that narrative and remove the labels and provide better design outcomes? So this is where we're gonna jump into this interactive portion of this presentation here. And I want you guys to just to just go with me here. And I, hold on one second. And I want you to read, and, and these are gonna be some questions. They're not trick questions, I promise. This is really just for us to engage um, in a very kind of authentic conversation. So bear with me as I get the right presentation up here. And I told you, you'd hear my dog. Now she's deciding to have her dinner. Here we go. All right. All right, we're gonna just stick with this and we're gonna roll with it. All right, so we're ready. All right, I am going to, and again, I'm, when I say pick on you, it's not because I'm picking on you, it's because I wanna engage you. So I'm gonna pick on, Maxwell, because you've just been like giving me all the good feels on your camera so far. So Maxwell, we are walking in. So I'm going to have you unmute yourself. Get ready. Um, we are we've designed a 
multifamily building and there is a leasing office. So, you know, you come in your leasing office and you sit down with the property management person and you got to sit in a guest chair. Max, so I want you to tell me which one of these chairs do you think is suitable for a guest chair in a leasing office? And tell me the color and describe it for me. Um, so I would say, so you're saying it's a, the guest chair that the person that's going to be leasing will be sitting in? You, you come into the leasing office and you want to rent an apartment. Which chair would you think would be appropriate for that setting? Well, I would think it would be the left one because that's what we've been, I've been seeing. Okay, so the black and white one? Yes. Okay, all right, that's fair. All right, so now we're in a senior housing building. Um, think about a space your grandmother, your grandfather lives, senior housing. I'm gonna pick on Natalie Miller. Um, Natalie, tell me which one of these chairs do you think is applicable for a senior environment? Um, I would say probably the, the, the first one, the one on the left. All the poster? Yes. Okay, that's fair. All right. Uh, I see a Jared Roberts. Jared, are you paying attention over there? Because I'm gonna um, have you unmute yourself shortly. All right, Jared. So we're designing an office space, an office lobby. Which one of these chairs, the light gray one or the dark gray one with the gold base, would you see in an office setting? Um, the one on the left looks a little bit more like form, uh, more formal. The one on the right is more luxurious. So Lovely. I'd probably go with the one on the left for okay. a fine setting. Okay. All right, fantastic. So let's talk about this. Um, why are these chairs labeled, right? Who has decided to, to label these chairs? Industry, manufacturing, um, and it, it's kind of like, why do they need to be labeled? And when you think about a senior chair, what makes a chair a senior chair? It's the seat height and the arm height, right? The same thing goes for this guest chair. So we've used the, this uh, senior chair with a black arm in a senior housing project. And when we took, we first presented this chair to the client, they said to us, not that they didn't like it, not that it was over budget. They just said, it just doesn't feel like a senior chair. So we dropped this chair off at one of their previous properties where the, it was senior housing. And we left it there for about a week and a half. And we go back to pick it up and the property manager is like, Kia, we're a little upset with you. And I was like, why, what did I do? And they said, all of the residents here wanna know how come we don't have this type of chair, right? So had I only selected this upholstered chair because that's what's marketed as a senior chair, I would have been doing myself in this community a disservice. So the, the point I'm trying to make here, the way that we label furniture is no different than how we subconsciously or consciously label design outcomes and decides who deserves what when it comes to designing spaces. All right, we're gonna do some more engagement and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give three people a heads up, four people a heads up. Shelby, Megan, Alexis, I'm coming for you. I'm going to be asking you some questions, so be prepared to unmute yourselves. I'm going to start with Megan Vasquez. Here we have an image of a common area, a public space. Megan, I want you to unmute yourself and tell me who do you think this space is for and what type of project is it? Um, I think it's probably for like people who want to have like a gathering. So people who are in like a conference, maybe. Okay. Okay. So maybe like a, a commercial office space, conference space, yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, Shelby, what type of project do you think this is and who is it for? Um, I don't know, maybe like it looks like it's in a home. It doesn't look like it's like an office space or anything. So. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Did I say Alexis, I was going to pick on you? Yeah. All right, Alexis, tell me what project type you think this is and who is this space for? Um, 
I feel like maybe it's for a school, like an education space, maybe okay. students or teachers. That's fair. Alexis, you're a student, right? Yep. Would you want to study in this space? Um, you can be honest. No, probably not. Okay, that's fine. Right. That's fine. All, right. All right, we got one more space here. So who did I not pick on? Is it Raina? Raina Howell? Yeah, hi. Hi, tell me who you think this space is for. What project type? Um, probably just, it looks like it's in a home. So probably just a meeting of a few friends, probably enjoying the afternoon. Okay, that's fair. So the thing here is all these spaces are affordable housing. And the problem that happens here is this is what you would see today in new construction. Oh, we have a missing image here. These two images are projects that we've designed where it's not necessarily about designing for low income communities. It's really about creating an elevated design experience. And the thing that we have to realize is that when it comes to design, it's not about what their socioeconomic standing is, but that we're thinking about this idea of community and people. And this notion that community is really about bringing people together, sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. And why does this really matter? Because when we start to label each other, we find all these ways to distinguish how we're not in com not common or united. And it shows up in, in phrases like this, affordable housing versus market rate, education versus hospitality, poor and low income versus wealthy. And these types of labels, not only do they frankly often boil back down to race and, and segregated communities, but these types of labels also can disrupt entire communities. Because when we say education, or we think about a space for kids, you often start to see things like this. This is a building called Kids Space, right? Obviously, right? But it also did these, made these blatant architectural and design decisions where it's like, it's a kid's space. So that means we have to have these arbitrary primary colors all up and down the facade of this prominent street here in Washington, DC, that pretty much has a historical landscape in a residential community. So our architectural partner here felt like it's kid space. We need primary colors and blocks, but not looking at the context of the community. And these types of identifiers is what limits our design outcomes. And what happens is when you see labels, you don't see people and then you don't see what's possible. And for us, it's really starting to understand that everyone deserves access to well-designed spaces. So how do we start to do this? This is one of the things that, you know, this is always a, a, a hot topic, right? We always, we wanna use a lot of evidence-based design and data. We're waiting for data and statistics to tell us what to do, right? It's kind of like, oh, all this research on natural light. And I think if any of us right now stood next to a, a, a window, do you need data to tell you that that exposure to natural light will uplift you, bring you joy and some type of solace. So that's why if I always say we should be careful where we're waiting on data and statistics to tell us how to do better, when really what we should start doing is acknowledging the demographics that are labeled, even when it's uncomfortable, poor, affordable, urban, black, revitalizing, renewal. Those are fancy ways of saying gentrification. And who are those communities typically? we have to start thinking about our language. We use a lot of language and design that is very us against them when it should really be language about joining us, not the user, but the people, not built environment, but human spaces, not I, but we, not their communities, but ours. And this repetition and these small tweaks in our language is how we can change behavior, connect each other, and then start to create spaces with a more empathetic lens. And I am convinced that interior design is the greatest form of empathy in practice. We just really have to start seeing ourselves and looking for the stories of communities. And that leads us 
to these design concepts. So our, our definition of a design concept is a creation of elements and spaces and materials that translate from historical community context that connects to all people. And I'm gonna walk through a few project examples here this is a project that we're working on in, in here in Washington, DC. It's one of the largest public housing redevelopments called Berry Farm. And our concept for this project is opening the senses of ascension. And how did we get here, right? This community, it used to be a centralized fishing port. So everyone would come to the center of the yard. This image here is of Howard University, the yard, a prominent location here in DC. Howard Schultz is the, was, a uh, berry farm was the brainchild development for this community post-war. This is the junkyard band, Go Go Mugus. It's really big in Washington, DC, right? It's a sensory experience. And then the community itself is located in an area called Hillsdale. So our idea here was to take all these elements and create design moments that was interactive and constantly moving your eye up and ascending you and creating this truly sensory experience. So here's our common area into the main lobby. So one of the things that you start to see is these undulating ceiling elements that take you up and down. But the main feature here is creating this interactive wall. So as people move throughout the space, the name of prominent figures will illuminate so the more active and alive the space is, the more interactive the history comes out. And why is this important? It's important because when we think about design concepts, the idea is really to tell the story of community and make sure that narrative doesn't get lost in how a community may turn, whether it goes from a predominantly black community to a uh, integrated community or to a predominantly white one. It is not, design is about maintaining the longevity of stories and communities. There's another project we worked on, it's called Archer Park Apartments. Um, in the building, it, Archer was named after Romulus Cornelius Archer. He was the second black registered architect in the district. And I thought that was a beautiful narrative. So what we did is we went around the city of Washington DC and took pictures of all of his buildings. And then we abstracted several design concepts and themes that we saw. So our concept for this project became centered on symmetrical contrast. And one of the things we started to do was take pictures of his, his of his work and did these large custom graphic installations. And in various places, there are little placards that tell the narrative that this building in a predominantly black neighborhood, you, you have little brown boys and girls living in a building named after a man who built buildings. And if that's not inspiring and uplifting and kind of planting that seed, can I be a person who does that one day? Um, and this is all derived from these community-centered design concepts and stories, not styles, not themes, not mid-century, not contemporary, not this, but what's the context, right? We have to create design for communities. And this is the thing, when we talk about communities, all people have to be present in order to see all people. And this is where you get into this idea of, we talked about community is commonality, right? And this is where diversity also plays a key role in that. You have to think about, um, when you, you think about a major development happening in any major city, um, there is always this moment where you have your architectural partner and you have your developer and they have to go to these community meetings. And if you're working in a low income community, what do you think that it feels like when you see white developer, white architectural team coming in, standing up front, and then the audience is a predominantly black community? That's a big drastic disconnect. And this is where that diversity piece comes in. If your design teams do not reflect the communities that you're serving, you are doing a disservice to them. And it's because of these labels that we continue to put on who should be designing, who should be the developer, that we don't see this change. And this also is brings to this idea of community engagement. You should as an architect and a designer, you know, you oftentimes will have to do these community meetings to really um, sell the project, right? But community engagement should not be one of those things you, that you do to check the box. 
It should be about partnering with the nonprofit organizations, programs, and agencies, thinking outside of the traditional um, design verticals and really immersing yourself into that community. And this is a piece that's really, really important to me is mentorship. One of the things that we do at Determined by Design is we create this integrated approach where in our scope, in our contracts, we make sure that we partner with schools from the K through 12 range and identify two to three students and immerse them in the entire design process, right? So what we're doing is we're one, cultivating this pipeline of the a and industry because you don't see more diverse firms because the pipeline is broken. So by doing this, we're now creating this idea of mentorship, firsthand experience, and also giving them voice and agency in being a part of larger developments to designing their community. That's where mentorship truly, truly happens. This is, I wanna, I wanna show us, I wanna show one more video after this, but these are some of the phrases that we hear from our development partners. And when they're speaking like this, us as design professionals, it's our job to challenge these notions every time, to feel empowered, to say, you gotta check these biases at the door. Because when I think about right now, people who are living in, public housing built 50 and 60 years ago with lead paint, poor indoor air quality, um, asbestos, no natural light. There are people living in subpar living conditions. And if we don't speak up now in 50 years, when it's the next pandemic, we'll stay in exactly the same place. So I wanna share one video and then I wanna open this dialogue up for conversation and questions. So it's, bear with me here. Eyes on the door. This is a programmatic request. It's also a bias that plagues affordable housing. The design solutions to meet this need has been indignified for years. This was a design solution. An octagonal leasing office wall with windows. This type of solution is sharply reminiscent of the pan octagon design used in prisons. There is no space for this type of solution in affordable housing. An alternative approach would have been an asymmetrical wall with storefront that would allow space for soft seating, art, and possibly a decorative finish. More importantly, a school-aged boy would not have to feel like coming into his front door, he needed to be watched. He will be met with plexiglass at the local corner store, the local post office, and banks. He will be met with this same watchful eye in retail stores, and unfortunately, at his home. This is why design equity matters. So I really want us to think about the communities that we're designing and the impact that we have, not just today, but for generations to come. And I wanna open it up for questions at this time. Thank you, Philip, for the applause. I love it, I love it, I love it. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Maxwell. I see Martin popped in here. Questions, comment. Thank you, Shelby. No questions, guys? Come on. I'll um, smooth the floor. It's, it's always hard to ask the first question, right? Um, 
also for the YouTube um, people who are watching for from YouTube, you can actually uh, write in the chat box and we'll share it with Kia and ask your questions for you. Um, you talked about vocabulary um, in the end of your, uh, towards the end of your presentation. And I found it very interesting and it's in every part of, of, of lives and in architecture, it's like quite, quite interesting to see that in one page and because we hear it a lot. I'm a product designer myself, but even I he hear it in some projects similarly. Um, so what are the steps? Well, except of course you actively need to fix, but you're an educator as well. How do you, what are the steps you're taking so, so one this that's a good question. So one of the very simple things that I do whenever I'm typing any correspondence, I take I out of it, right? I, it's always we should, we think, right? And I think it, it seems so subtle, but when you take I out of your, your lexicon and your vocabulary, it constantly keeps you in the mindset of thinking about others. And if, and if, if in your day-to-day um, correspondence and dealings that you're doing that in your professional and creative um, process. When you start to say we we think for this community and our community, it it shows up a little bit easier. So you don't use language that separates you from the person and or that you're providing a service or design for. Is that fair? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. And I think it's small bites sometimes that really um small things not big chunks um this word um built environment using language that is softer uh i, I think when you think about one of the things I, I always say about interior design specifically we design to the scale of people and sometimes our architectural they design at the scale of buildings and communities and how do we soften that so it's using softer language in our vernacular um words like dignity a lot we hear this a lot of times in affordable housing yeah there should be a dignified space and, I, and i'm saying that's the bare minimum that any space should be is dignified why not say we need a space that is beautiful ethereal right warm and i think using these and again this is that language piece it's the subtle tweaks in our language um that really will help us shift our mindset when we are, start designing for people especially in disenfranchised demographics is that fair does that answer your question yes it does thank you so kia i would want to see if you could um, elaborate a little bit. I love what you said about your feeling that interior design is the most empathetic um, practice because I, we, I, I think if you talk to any of our students here, um, I am uh, interior design faculty and empathy is our driving factor. It's the mm -hmm. idea of people and remembering what it would be like to be in someone else's shoes. So how can you just elaborate a little bit yeah. on that and how to foster the growth of that for oh, our students? Love that question. So one of the things that we we do sometimes we and I don't like to call it a charrette, right? When we are engaging with a developer for the first time, um, we always start to listen for some of those those bias statements, right? And uh, the, uh, one of the big things is the multi-purpose room, right? There'll be a multi-purpose room and they'll say, we just want folding tables and chairs in this multi-purpose room. And we want people to have birthday parties and, and baby showers and gather in this space. And then I say to them, well, if you were gonna have a birthday party for your son or for your daughter, what would you want that space to look like? And I ask them to start to describe it for me. And they don't say, well, we wanted to have LVT and bright colors. And then they say, you know what? We, we want a place that's warm, it has natural lights, it's soft, um, it's engaging, it's inviting, right? And then what I'm doing in that moment is having them think about a design outcome that will be good enough for their loved one. And then what I'll do next is I'll pull up an image of a multi-purpose room. That, that multi-purpose room that I think Shelby said, I said, would you want to study in there? Something similar to that, but uglier, right? And they'll be like, oh, no, no, no. We wouldn't want a birthday party for our kids in that space. And this is where I get them every time. 
it will be a multi-purpose room of a project I pulled from their website. And that stops them in their tracks every, every time. And then I have to challenge them. If you wouldn't want a space like this for your child, why is it good enough for the people who live in your communities? And I think that is how you always put this empathetic lens on design, not thinking about, is this space durable or how will we maintain it if these people tear it up? But would you want your loved one here? And I think of a lot of times in design, I think the challenges, the challenge that we face, it goes back to this diversity piece, not because just right now everyone's talking about it, but if you think about what the interiors and architecture profession looks like, especially architecture, if you think about the 45 plus year old white man who's been at the same architecture firm for 20 plus years, right? Constantly designing affordable housing. Do you think he has any to desire to challenge a developer? Do you think he has any connection to those communities to say, this isn't good enough. And I think that's the problem, right? And this is not to say every person of color who comes into the a and space is from a low income community, but it's also kind of having that, that cultural connection to say like, hey guys, do better. Because I could possibly see my mother, my brother or my sister or my grandmother living in that space. So I want to do something better for them. I think that's where the empathy piece comes in. That's where the diversity and the equity piece comes in. If your teams aren't diverse, so you can have some type of emotional connection, right? Then you're not gonna be able to impart empathy into that design process. And that's why it's like, you constantly have to challenge your developer, um, your, your cross-disciplinary counterparts to say, is this good enough, right? For people, not the low income people, not because they were chronically homeless, but look at them as people. And that's where the empathy comes in. But we have to challenge them. And a lot of times our development partners are telling us our A and D counterparts, they're not challenging them. And I think that's the problem. We as interiors know empathy is important, but do we challenge our clients and our counterparts in, in, in the verticals to do the same thing? Is that fair? For sure. So how do you, when they come back at you with budget talk, you know, and when you, when you tell them, like, when you talk, you get them to actually feel it, but then they're like, oh, but we can't afford anything but LBT. Like, oh, so that's, that's our job, right? So we are working on an affordable housing project. It's coming out of the ground here right now. It'll be done in, in three weeks. And we did not have to VE out a single design feature element, fixture, finish. How did we do that? And that's a feat, not just for affordable housing, but whether it's a hotel, class A, market rate building, whatever, right? So we've done a couple of things. We were one, intentional with our design concept. So every design decision that we made, there was intentionality to it. Two, we thought about the, the last person to touch the product, right? And as a design, as designers, we have access to like a smorgasbord of materials and light fixtures and tiles, right? So we're just gonna pick on tile. You, you think about an apartment building, you got tile on the floor in the lobby, in the bathrooms, in the common areas, on the walls, some accent features. Then you have 104 units and you got tile in the bathroom and then the walls, right? That's a lot of tiles, but as designers, if we do all that tile in 10 different tile manufacturers, and then we're thinking about everyone in the process, right? Empathy. So who's the last person to touch that tile before the residents, the subcontractor? Nine times out of 10 is a minority subcontractor. So you're now asking a subcontractor to go to 10 different vendors, right? 10 different ways to finances, accounts, set up, right? And that type of thinking, this is where the breakdown gets in pricing, right? If we would have used one tile manufacturer, we would have had greater buying power on the overall pro project. That's step one, right? Use like manufacturer, use the same manufacturer for like materials. And this is when it comes to understanding that all the time, we keep picking on time, all the time manufacturers get from the same plant overseas, it's just being strategic in your selection of materiality. The second thing that we do is we force 
transparency when it comes to product. And the biggest culprit there is light, lighting, right? The light fixture isn't $20,000. It's just been marked up six different ways excessively that makes it unaccessible, right? Prime example, this same project, you know, we specified a four inch square recess light fixture. And the GC says, oh, the, the fixture determined by design specified is $400 per fixture. And I said, wait, what? So I get on the phone and I call my lighting rep and I say, Marissa, why would you let me specify a $400 recess light fixture? And she goes, Kia, no, no, that fixture is $175. Well, where did they get that $400 from? Because their VE option was $275. And I'm like, oh, okay, really? And you know, we do our due diligence. And what it really boiled down to is the GC just wanted the kickback and wanted to use their vendor, right? So even with a 60% markup, my, my fixture will, would have still been cheaper. But the problem is no one checks the general contractor on this lack of transparency that exists in the procurement process. And all that does is price out design outcomes. At the end of the day, who do you think won? Our four inch square recess fixture is in that project. Now, is a resident going to come in and say, oh, my God, this four inch square recess fixture is amazing? No. But if you're doing it on the light fixture, you're doing it on the wall covering, you're doing it on the decorative accessories, you're doing it on all the other materials that can possibly elevate that process. So that's how we're able to design um, and still elevate the spaces and within budget. And the thing that's been pissing me off as of late is I'll be like, oh, I do affordable housing. People are like, oh my God, you do free work? We can donate some discontinued material to you. Do you want some coffee table? And it's like, please don't be confused. We use hospitality grade fixtures, finishes, and materials. We are just intentional with it. We, we utilize our buying power by doing volume. Just because we do low-income housing doesn't mean we use low-income material. And I think it's these types of disconnects. Um, the same thing goes with furniture right? You know, we'll, we'll have clients that'll say no soft seating, no soft seating in the lobby, um, vinyl everything. And it's why as designers, we understand that using a institutional or contract grade CON will, will meet all the durability needs and requirements and longevity of the poor people that tear up furniture that our developers say. It's us challenging those conventions and that thought process is how we're able to do elevated design outcomes. You know, the sofa isn't $5,000, it's just marked up. So one of the things that we do, our cost is the part, our cost of the client, why not? And I think as an industry, we need to get away from these exorbitant markups to make it seem like our service is for only for, for the, the upper echelon, right? And I think it's these types of things is how we're able to design within budget. Um, and you have to fight for it. We, I, I mean, GCs, they love me or hate me. I really don't care. But my elevated design outcomes, that's for the community, for the people, not for that general contractor. That's how we design within budget. You have to fight for your spec to stick and understand that process holistically. And that even comes to like the GMP, which is like the big budget for the overall development process project. And it, it never fails that a lot of our development clients, they they don't even think we need to come to the, the table for the project. And this is why I love, I love this program, this integrated approach, right? What I deal with right now is a lot of architectural partners who say, we don't need the interior design firm. We don't need them to much further down the design process. And I think it has to start with education, us realizing we're all in this together and are an integrated service provider. So when when my when my architectural partner is trying to get the project bid, right, to set the budget, and you don't even you haven't even incorporated any interiors, and you don't stop your client and say, hey guys, we need to price the interiors in our budget. And then it's like going, it's like saying we're gonna have spaghetti for dinner. We're going to have spaghetti for dinner and we're going to have noodles, sauce, and meat. And that's how much we need to go to the grocery store with, right? 
And then all of a sudden you come back and you say, you know, we want bread, we want cheese, we want a salad, we want wine and we want dessert. And then you're surprised like, well, why is the project over budget? And interiors is the salad, the bread, the dessert, right? And I think our architectural counterparts need to advocate for us to be at the table in that design process early. Um, Matthew from YouTube, how could someone implement design equity when there is little interest in equity from other members of the, de the design and development process? Matthew, you have to challenge them. That's where I started. I started literally um, on my soapbox saying, make that space is pretty for these people. And I had to understand that if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense, right? So this is where it goes back to Jenna's question. How do I design within the budget? It's I had to understand the finance of um, the GMP of a major development deal. I had to understand what were the big ticket items. That's how you get them to care, right? And for my design counterparts who had little to no interest, most of the times on a development deal, sometimes I can partner with an architecture, a architecture firm. I took out the middleman, right? I took out the architecture firm and went straight to the source, the developer. So when there's little interest, you have to start by understanding what's their bottom line, what's important to them, and, and, and learn that first and immerse yourself in that first and then that's how you start to implement change. Um, and you have to understand what matters to them and then input your mission. Um, but that's how I did it. No one, no one was interested. I had developers say, interior designer, what? No, aren't you here just to pick the furniture and the, and the drapes, right? So you have to chip away at it. And I will say the good thing is, Matthew, we have development partners now who, who are like, well, wait a second, how come our, how come our, our previous a and firms didn't do this, right? So it gives me hope that there is a, a smidge more interest and they want us to speak up and challenge them um, to do better because I think they're realizing the disservice that they've been doing to communities. Um, Matthew, I hope that answered your question. If not, definitely make sure you reach out to me. Um, any other questions, comment? I see Shelby say, this makes me so excited for my future. Good, good, Shelby. I'm gonna pick on you here for a second. Don't take it personal, but this is what happens, right? Shelby's gonna be, she's she's young, 22. She's gonna graduate. Shelby might end up in a predominantly male firm. Shelby might be doing some affordable housing. And are those men gonna empower Shelby to speak up when she sees something that's like, hey guys, this is kind of crappy. So Shelby, I need you to speak up, right? Because your firm might, might not be diverse, right? You might be working on projects in low income communities. And I need you to feel empowered to challenge the status quo that sometimes, not all, that our architectural partners do. So I need you to be excited. I need you to be empowered to use your voice to realize. And I always say, I'm just the interior designer, but I'm just the interior designer that has developers changing their model, um, their design standards to do elevated things in affordable and low income housing. And I chipped away at it slowly, Matthew, just as the designer girl the black designer girl at that, right? So I think all these things are really, really important, but we need everyone to be empowered. That's how you make change and realize your voice, your craft and your skill is how we will build communities going forward. So, so be, be, be very excited, Shelby, very excited. I have a question. Yes. Um, have you done anything beyond housing? Oh, good question. So I'm, I think we know, I'm not really big on labels, right? I do projects where, is there a demographic and or person who is not getting an elevated design experience, period? That's where we start. So a couple, maybe two years ago, we were, I was approached by a, some small business owners, um, Dr. Regina Hasman, Hampton and Jasmine Joan. And both of them had experience or had loved ones who experienced breast cancer. And they were telling me about the experience of being fitted for a prosthesis is very indignified. And I, I just, I had no 
I didn't know that. So we ended up designing for them a boutique lingerie store for breast cancer survivors of color. And the mission here was to create this elevated design experience for them. So it was a retail lingerie space. So for me, it's not about do I do housing or do I do retail? Do I design for people who don't have access to well design spaces? Uh, we also did a bookstore and coffee shop in Philadelphia called Uncle Bobby's, right? small business owner of color. And everyone told him, you can't put a bookstore in this community, a bookstore and a coffee shop. And we created this elevated experience for that community and for this. And it just so happened to be a retail project. We're doing a American Legion Post 139. Everyone in their mind, if you've ever been, know what an American Legion Post is, is this, you, you think white men in ball caps with pins who were in the Vietnam War, right? You have a whole generation of veterans who don't realize the rich history of an American Legion. So we're designing an American Legion Post that's attached to affordable housing for veterans. And we're completely reimagining the way the next wave of, of American Legion posts should look because we wanna elevate that design experience. So while a lot of our work is in multi-unit housing, it's really about bringing design to people who don't have it and changing the narrative and the status quo. Is that fair? I, th how, I think we have eight more minutes. How are we doing on time? We're doing good on time. Okay. Philip, you did a lot. I saw you doing a lot of nodding and thumbs up over there. Yeah. Well, I, have, I completely more enjoy your um, the strength and the attitude that you're taking into this. I wanted I wanted to see maybe if we could elaborate on something that you talked about in the lecture, which I thought was um, another aspect of of your own passion, and that's bringing young people into the design process and then allowing them from. I mean, not and not not in a way that seems to be superficial, but embedded them in the entire process from one end and just like riff on it. So here's, here's the thing, right? If you think, I hear all the time people tell me about how they got to design and architecture. And they say, my dad was an architect and he used to have the plans and I see him draw, or my grandfather was a general contractor and he would take me to the site, right? And I think if, not everyone has that experience. And it's the seeds of career and, and, and craft are planted in these very fundamental years that start in grade school and middle school. And I think what agency could you give to a child if you're saying, hey, come to this meeting where there's trace and Sharpies and markers, and we're gonna be asking you things about how to build your community. What ideation can come from that? And I think if we start to think about, you know, for us, a table is a table is a table, but for a child, a table could be a stool. It could be, it could be a many things, right? So if you start really immersing them into that design process with intentionality, not just when they're a junior in high school and they gotta go get an internship, but how can they be a part of this integrated design process? I think that's how you build the next wave of A and D professionals um, by saying, hey, come along with me. This might, it might not be you stay interested in interiors. Maybe you you hear the conversation about civil, civil engineering and urban planning, and that sparks another conversation. But I think the mentorship is key um, because people don't know what's accessible to them unless they see someone who looks like them possibly doing. And I think that's where this mentorship piece is important. And for us as a firm, you know, we were going into these communities, but we also, we didn't want to just go into them. We wanted to be immersed into them and using the ideation of kids and in high school and the collegiate level, it just was, it made sense. And we were able to develop greater design ideas um, where they go next. You know, maybe they become the next developer. I think that piece is really, really important. Um, and I think we should be doing that 
every day in all aspects of our lives, right? If, if Natalie, if you know someone from from your high school who might be interested in design, you should be you should be inviting them to your virtual design presentations, right? It's bringing someone along with you. If you see one who someone who doesn't look like you, you know what? Let me go identify someone who doesn't quite look like me and bring them along in that process. That's mentorship. That's building agency. That's creating the pipeline. Um, that's why that's so important to me. I see Andres came on. Welcome. I have another question. Um, you've talked a lot about developers, and I think, you know, traditionally, developer is a bad word in the architecture world. And I feel like it's changed. I know I, I've had that comment said to me because as an interior designer, um, with the kind of changing nature of commercial real estate, I've been working more closely with developers. Um, can you just speak on that relationship? And you kind of said, you alluded to that you've been working directly with them. So most of my clients are for-profit or non-profit developers. And I, I, sometimes it is the big bad developer, but... I, I can say we have great development partners who want to do better. So for me, and, the, and these are for-profit and non-profit developers, I'll be fair. Um, we, do we still have developers who on their market rate deals or class A deals, they go soup to nuts, sparkle, glitter, ribbon and everything and not do the same on their affordable? Absolutely. Do we still challenge them? Absolutely. Do we still have a long way to go? Absolutely. Are they the ones who tell me they stripped that project there? Yes. Right. But we still we also have developers who are just like, you know, how can we do better? And you know what? We're, they are acknowledging uh, we, one of our projects in Boston, um, it's a renovation and they're like, did we, did we do anything better here? And they realized that their misstep was not bringing it into your design firm. So that gives me hope. If it is big, bad, anyone, and I never like to throw anyone on the bus, it's the general contractor. I, I mean, it's that model that is broken. And I think about general contractors have been keeping the, a budget for level one granite for the last 20 years. And you mean to tell me at no point has, have you thought that there's a better material there? And it, it, it's just kind of like, they're, they're the gatekeepers, right? It's where all the shadiness happens for me. So my focus is kind of shifted from the developer to bumping heads with the GC all day. Um, and, 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 and frankly, that's where the problems it, it lies. Sometimes I'm this close to thinking, okay, I need to build, I need to build my own GC build business, right? I don't have the time, but I think that's, that's the, the breakdown. Um, in the process, not necessarily the developer. And especially when it's a nonprofit developer, we have some amazing, um, like POA, uh, Preservation of Affordable Housing, the Community Buildings, APA, Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. These are all nonprofit developers who are trying to push the needle and they wanna do better. Um, we, we have, they've come along, I'll say they've come a long way. I, I will say from eight years ago, um, but it goes back to, back to, to Matthew's question, right? We constantly reinforce our value. That's how we change their mind. And this project that finishes in the, in a few weeks, I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's glorious. It's freaking glorious. I'm excited. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really exciting. I see Lillian came on. Hi, Lillian. How often are you renovating those spaces? the affordable housing like in general? Well, so so typically on affordable housing, on a new a new bill, we try to do a refresh the same as anything like a market rate. Um, we're looking at that five to eight year range. Um, one of the things that we've started doing a lot more is um, renovations of existing assets. You have a lot of developers now buying these garden style apartments uh, that are dismal. And they don't even think that they need to, to implement, use it and utilize an interior designer, right? They only think, okay, new construction, yes, but what about an existing asset that you're gonna renovate? So we are starting to provide what we call EDS, Equitable Design Solutions, 
where we come in, we provide a lighter touch service and literally still do the concept development, but only provide a finished package, right? We can provide a complete finished package from the units all the way down to the cabinet pools, hardware fixtures. And this at least allows us to touch it because we've, we've had developers and architects just say, well, we do the same cabinet for the past 10 years, same door style, same color, same everything. And it's like, please don't say that out loud, like that's a good thing. Um, no one checks these types of things. So when we work on these renovation projects, it's a great way for just us to elevate units uh, with a little bit more intentionality and, and softness. And while I love this integrated approach to your program, please tell me that our architectural counterparts take color theory or some type of it needs to be done asap asap in a quick fast in a hurry they are in our freshman the freshman yeah. shared curriculum yep and and i think that's just one of those little things like you know this is and and i i think in design there's this conversation of are you a decorator are you a designer are you interior architect Look, there's softness and aesthetic and beauty is about our craft, right? We should hone that, we should maintain it. Um, we should see its value and its place. And I think that's what's missing. We're too busy trying to be important that we're forgetting softness and beauty is still a necessity in all spaces at all times. I saw Max. Oh, totally about. agree. Um, so we're over time, so I don't want to hold you up. I know you are busy. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's any last comments or questions. Otherwise, we will uh, wrap up. Can Thank, I just say, oh. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Go ahead, Maxwell. Go ahead. My background looks just like your room. Ah! Thank you. I had to be reframed coming back. <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. Thank you so yes. much for this invitation. Thank you for, I, I for coming. So we're safe and I can come in person. I We can't wait to have you in person here in Detroit. Thank you so much, Kia. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good day.